never had. So that's pretty impressive. Uh, but it was absolutely amazing. I would have liked to have been there a couple weeks later to see what kind of foliage pops up out of the desert. That would be pretty cool. But uh, it's it's an awesome experience. You don't have to go with me, but if you ever get a chance to go to Israel, it's it's amazing, absolutely amazing. It's life changing, and you can talk to some of these people. And with that in mind, I want to just kind of look at um, some scripture this morning that is found in Deuteronomy, Deuteronomy chapter 6, verse 4 to verse 9. Now, you know, you're familiar with this portion of Scripture, but not out of Deuteronomy. You're familiar with this out of Matthew 22. Jesus was talking to some Pharisees and some uh, Sadducees, and he had answered the Sadducees so well that the Pharisees jumped in there, and they thought that they could trap him. And this one Pharisee was a lawyer, and so he asked Jesus this weird question. He says, what's the greatest of all the commandments? Now you're thinking, you're thinking when you hear that word, you're thinking the Ten Commandments, right? Well, there were hundreds of commandments, hundreds and hundreds of commandments in the Bible. The Ten is only just a, a little tiny slice in comparison. It's only a percent of all the commandments that were in the, in the Old Testament. So when he was asking which is the greatest, he wasn't thinking just the Ten Commandments. He's thinking about all the commandments. And Jesus quotes this commandment out of Deuteronomy, and it's funny where it's found. Now, if you're in Deuteronomy chapter 6, if you have your Bibles this morning, uh, <clears throat> Jesus himself calls this the greatest commandment ever written or the greatest commandment ever spoken by God. Um, I find it interesting where it's located. This is located the second time that the law was given. The first time that the law was given is in Exodus. The Ten Commandments is found in uh, chapter 20 of the book of Exodus, the commandments that you're familiar with. And uh, as you consider that, Deuteronomy, or Deuto, or the second time, it's kind of like our Greek word dual that you're familiar with if you drive truck. But uh, the idea of the second time that it was uh, written, this portion of Scripture was actually the first. Uh, this isn't in uh, Exodus. But we have the Ten Commandments in Exodus 20, and in chapter 5 of Deuteronomy, you have, again, the repeat of the Ten Commandments. Now, why was it repeated? Well, simply spoken because of the fact that the people older than 40 had all perished. And so the people from 40 on down, except for Joshua and Caleb and Moses, we're all new to the law. So Moses gives the law a second time to the people that would eventually go on into the promised land. But I find this fascinating because this is the only time this is mentioned, and yet Jesus calls this one the greatest of all the commandments, and it's not in the Ten Commandments. You would think if Jesus asked which is the greatest of all the commandments, immediately you go to the Ten Commandments, like I said. But you would think that Jesus would have pulled one of those. You know, he would have pulled one of those out of his hat and said, there, there's the greatest of the Ten Commandments. And yet he doesn't. He cites this singular commandment that Moses spoke. Now, Moses is the one that shares it, but it's from God's heart that was given to Moses. And so that's what makes it really important. So what we're going to do is we're going to read this. And then we are going to see it in a greater light than just in Matthew 22. Because Jesus quotes it. He says, you know, you're going to love the Lord your God with all your heart and all your soul and all your might. And then he states that the greatest commandment past that is second unto it would be to love your neighbor as yourself. Well, you all know that, right? But have you ever <coughs> torn that apart? And that's what we're going to do this morning to really see what God really intended here. And then I'm going to share something with you from the land of Israel, okay? All right, so let's just read it. Now, this is the commandment. <clears throat> And these are the statutes and judgments. He's referring to the commandments that have been given, uh, including the ten that are in chapter 5. And he says, uh, the judgments which the Lord your God has commanded to teach you, that you may observe them in the land which you are crossing over to possess, that you may fear the Lord your God to keep all his statutes and his commandments which I command you. You and your sons and your grandsons uh, all the days of your life, and that your days may be prolonged. Therefore, hear, O Israel, this is the commandment that Christ is referring to, starts in verse 3. Hear, O Israel, and be careful to observe it, that it may be well with you, and that you may multiply greatly as the Lord God your fathers has promised you, 
a land flowing with milk and honey. So here we go. Hear, O Israel, the Lord our God, the Lord is one. You shall love the Lord your God with all your heart, with all your soul, with all your strength. And then he says these words, he said, that I've just shared with you, that commandment right there. He said, and these words which I commanded you today shall be in your heart. You shall teach them diligently to your children and talk of them when you sit down in your house and when you walk by the way, when you lie down and when you rise up. You shall bind them as a sign on your hand and they shall be as frontlets between your eyes. You shall write them on the doorposts of your house and on your gates. Well, this is called the Shema prayer. The Shema in Hebrew just simply means to hear or to listen. And this is a, this is a commandment that God starts out that you are to hear. You're to hear. Now, when somebody says to you, you know, like uh, uh, when my mother used my full name, I knew I should pay attention. You ever you had a mom like that? You know? uh, so when, you, when she throws in your middle name and your proper name at the start, you know, and she throws them in. Now, my grandmother didn't have that privilege because my mom only had one son. My grandmother had four sons, and so she would just list them all. You know, Glitty Skippy Daily, you know, she would just run them all the way down through. And Daily, of course, was my dad. Uh, Dale, but he had a, an E on the end because Skippy did and Glenny did and Gary did, so Daily, that's how that worked. But anyway, she just threw them all out there, and you better pay attention because you knew what was coming next, and that was the bowling pin. But... My mother, she would just use my full name. Well, I would pay attention. Well, this is God using your full name. This is God saying, I want you to pay attention. I want you to hear something. And so what he shares uh, in this Shema prayer is prayed at the, at the morning prayers in Israel. It's also prayed at the evening prayers of a, uh, an Orthodox Jew that is going to pay attention to God's word. And you'll see them on the news. If you've never been over to Israel, you'll see them kind of bobbing as they memorize this. It's a memorization trick uh, that they do. Just to, It's not magic. It's just a memorization trick. It works. Um, uh, you may look catatonic at times when you do that, but it does work. It's a memorization trick. Anything that is kinetic, that'll help your mind uh, remember. And so that's what they did. And we have uh, this uh, prayer that is given, but there are several things about this prayer. There are five things that I find to be fascinating. First of all, just real quickly, there's a doctrinal statement in it. Did you notice that? The Lord is one God. It's a monotheistic doctrinal statement. Why? Because at the time that this was written, and even in our world today, uh, polytheism was the thing that was going on. You had many gods, and we saw that you know even the Greek and the Roman Empire continued to to uh, spread that. Even um, you know, Caesar himself becomes a god, and you can worship him, and that was fine with the Romans and the Greeks and the rest of the world, but to the Jews, because they were monotheistic, they had a hard time with that. I'm not going to honor uh, Caesar as God. There is only one God. There's only one God. Now, this is a doctrinal statement, and you need to understand that a lot of religions have a God. Allah is a God, right? But he is not the God. And so when you are in the presence of somebody that says, just pray to your God, whoever it may be, you need to get out of that building. That is not of the Lord. There is only one true God. And in this portion of Scripture, notice that your word Lord is all capital letters. This is God's personal name. The word God only starts with a capital G because that's his position. That's his position. It's like the President of the United States has a personal name, but we call him Mr. President because that is his position. Do you understand that? So God is just simply that. It's his position, but his personal name, Jehovah, Lord God Almighty, is his full title. And we have that right here in this capitalized L-O-R-D. You'll find this word Lord with a capital L in small case. That's a totally different word for Lord. This one is his personal name. And so he's saying, this is the only God. You don't get any other choices. There's no second runner up. This is it. The Lord God, he says, I want you to hear from this Lord, this commandment. And so there's this doctrinal statement. Well, what is the commandment? <clears throat> well, the command here is found in verse 5. Love this Lord, your God, with all your heart. And that also includes in the Greek and in the Hebrew, the mind. And there's a, a pattern about uh, the the, uh, the mind, the emotion, and then action when it comes to uh, 
thinking in the Greek and in the terms of the Hebrew, there's these three parts. We don't use those three parts. We separate those, and we say, well, there's a thought, and you can let it go. They say, no, there's a thought that leads to an emotion <coughs> that leads to an action. If you don't have the action, you've never had the thought to start with. And so this is what he's saying here. He's saying, with all your heart, with all your soul, with all your strength. And, of course, this is repeated by Jesus. Now, Jesus adds the word mind, <coughs> and that's fascinating. He wants to make sure that you understand that that's a part of it. <coughs> Excuse me. In um, Matthew 22. Well, there's three realms of obedience here. This heart idea, the soul idea, the mind idea. The heart in the Hebrew, as I said, it's a feeling. Then you have emotion about that feeling. You have a mind, and it leads you into action. There's a soul involved. And a lot of people struggle with the soul. You know, what is the soul of man? Well, if you just look at it this way, you'll get it right almost all the time. If you consider the soul in the Bible <clears throat> as simply just your emotions. It's the emotional state of man. It's not the uh, mental state. It's not his spirit. That's a different thing. Uh, it's not what makes you alive. It is your personality. Your soul is your personality. The Word of God is a double-edged sword. It's able to divide asunder between the soul and the spirit. So they're two different things. The spirit is what keeps you alive. The soul is your emotion. And God thinks that it's important somehow to have your emotions involved in worshiping him. You know, why? You know, I'm, I'm not an emotional person. Some people say I had a married couple in my office, and it's always fun what you, what you learn from these experiences. Uh, you often want to just say, well, what you know has got you in my office, so shut up. But anyway, uh, I don't. I'm a, I'm a wonderful pastor, so I don't say things like that. I just think it. <laughs> is that wrong? That's not wrong, is it, Brent? No, okay. Uh, so, you know, the soul. And uh, this uh, wife was just an emotional wreck, a train wreck. And so uh, he said, she's just emotional, and I'm just not emotional. And he went off about it, and I said, yeah, you are. You're a very emotional person. And he just looked at me like I was crazy. I said, you just are emotionally mad all the time. You're just an angry person. You're both emotional. You need to calm down. But uh, that's what our soul is. The soul is the emotion. Why does God say, we can understand him saying, you know, that we should serve him and love him with all of our heart. That would be something that you would hear preachers say often and often. But have you ever heard preachers say, you need to serve and love God with all of your soul? What does that mean? Well, our emotions are tremendous drive. Huge drive. And we see that it's our greatest desire, our greatest motivator is our soul, our emotions. Love, anger, these kind of emotions drive you to do just about anything, things that you wouldn't think normally that you would do. You know, you look at uh, murder and you say, well, what's the reason for murder? Well, it might be because of money or whatever. One of the reasons for murder, you find out real quickly, is emotional. It's that drive of passion, right, that split uh, thought that comes over top of you and is so powerful that you even would kill for that. That's what God wants. He wants that kind of impressive power to be involved in your emotions to say that I love God and I want to serve him. Isn't that something? That's what God is saying. And then might. <clears throat> might is uh, you know, the, the fervor of the thing or the force of it, or, or we might even use a biblical term, <clears throat> the zeal of it. Um, it's what you would put out energy towards. I can tell a lot about you by what you put out energy towards. You know, bad or good. I can tell. You can tell a lot about me by what I put energy into, right? What you put energy into says a lot about you. And God says, do you put that kind of energy into me? You know, a lot of us are just passive about our Christian walk. Um, you know, we might come to church for the entertainment or to visit our friends or whatever. But, you know, there's not any energy in it. There's no energy in it. We don't put out anything for God. We got too many other things to put out for. Uh, I often hear people say, well, I don't have time for that. Yeah, you do. We all have the same amount of time. You just fill yours up differently than I do or somebody else does. But we all have the same amount of time. Don't give you that. That's just, you know, that's just not even true. And God says, I want your zeal. I want your fervor. That's how I want obedience. Well, there's three assumptions then. First of all, when you get this commandment, 
you know, it's a command to hear. That's where they get the Shema uh, prayer here. It's a command to hear. Uh, something is being said that's worth our attention. The second thing here and the third thing kind of go hand in hand. The second thing is who's speaking. Now, you know, <clears throat> we all have wife deafness, don't we? Well, I don't, but you do. You know, we have wife deafness. I had a man come to me one time and said, I realize that I'm getting deaf. He said, I went to the doctor. And he says, you know, it's been really funny. He says, there's certain, uh, you know, scale of where you're deaf. Are you aware of that? You know, low tones, high tones, whatever. He says, my wife's voice is right in the very tone where I'm deaf. <laughs> I just looked at him, you know, yeah, right. Uh, you know, and maybe that might be the case with you. But we all turn things out, don't we? Uh, you know, this is why commercials on TV are louder than the program, because they want to get your attention, right? And God says, I want you to hear this. This is important. But who is speaking? Who is speaking? God is speaking. Shouldn't that be important to us? If God is speaking, if he's asking us something, shouldn't that be the most awesome thing that we would want to hear? Why do we turn him on? Why do we, you know, deafen our ears towards God? <clears throat> the third thing is obvious then. If God is speaking and it's a command to hear, then God wants us to listen. He wants us to listen. You know, how many times have you seen references that relate to this verse that says, be still and know that I am God? Just to be still, just be quiet. We have too much noise in our life. Way too much noise in our life. Have you ever sat still without any noise? Have you ever done that? It drives you crazy, doesn't it? Yeah, you got to turn that radio on, then, don't you? Got to turn that TV program. You know, I go into people's homes and I'll talk with them about something very serious, something that they needed me to come over and talk to them. And it's a rare occasion; it does happen, but it's a rare occasion when they'll shut off whatever noise that they're listening to to have a conversation with me. Rare. Most of the time, they'll leave the TV on, the radio on, whatever else is on. They'll just leave it on, and I'm thinking. How in the world do they concentrate on what they're saying, let alone what I'm saying? But it's because we're so used to that. Now, there's nothing wrong with Christian music. And if you're depressed, uh, God has given us the garment of praise against the spirit of heaviness. And Christian music is one of the ways that you can get out of depression by just listening to praise music. There's nothing wrong with that. But if that praise music is keeping you from being quiet and listening to God, you need to shut it off. You need to shut it off. You need to tune out what the world is trying to do to distract you from hearing the still, small voice of the Holy Spirit. You try to have devotions and then just sit there and not pray and not read and just listen. It'll drive you crazy. I'm telling you, it's the hardest thing in the world for you to do as an American Christian. But God says, I want you to listen. I want you to listen. I think most of the time we're afraid to listen. Um, as a counselor, I watch how people control the conversation. You know, you talk to them, and they'll completely control the conversation. Why? Because they don't want me to talk about what we need to talk about. They'll control the conversation so that they have it in the path that they want it to be in. And if it gets quiet, all of a sudden, I might take it in a different direction. Nope, nope, nope. We've got to go over here. And that's what happens. Uh, see, that's why your wife does it. Anyway, okay. anyway these, uh, this then begs the question, you know, are we listening? I think that's a good question. These categories encompass the entirety of the person. Uh, there's an application found here in verse 6. <coughs> Excuse me. And these words which I command you today shall be in your heart. So how do we do this? This application uh, that comes out of this, to saturate it in our hearts to the place where we're so saturated with this. What? With the Word of God. We're so saturated with what God wants to share with us that it completely changes our life. It completely changes the entirety of the person. And so there's an action to take. And notice this action found in verse 7. It's kind of interesting. It's two double negatives. It's, a, it's interesting. He says there's a, a sitting and walking and laying down and rising. Those are opposites. Isn't that interesting? What is he actually saying by that when he is using these two things, sitting and walking, all right, and then lying down and rising up? 
He's saying any teachable moment is what he's saying. You know, uh, an educator would use any teachable moment. Have you ever tried to answer a child's question? You know, Daddy, why does this happen? And you're giving this, you know, <clears throat> theology based on why a wheel comes off a toy truck, you know, and you're going on and on and on, and all of a sudden the kid's over here in the corner and he's playing, and you said, hey, wait a minute, I haven't gotten to the, you know, why? Because eventually the teachable moment quit. The teachable moment quit, and they're off and running now, and they don't care what in the world you're saying. Well, that's just a natural thing. It's a natural thing. It's hard to pay attention. Often they say that, you know, when a pastor is preaching, they'll say, well, the mind can only retain what the seed can endure, right? You know? And whether you're here or not physically, you're all somewhere else already repairing fence or, or uh, you know, taking that cow to the market, whatever you're doing in your head. And so we have teachable moments, and that's what God is saying. <clears throat> he says, I want you to teach these principles at any given time opportunity. That's why he's using these things that encompass pretty much everything. But there's an illustration. Verse 8 to verse 9. <coughs> Excuse me. <coughs> Do whatever it takes. He says, I need you to bind this to your hands. What does he mean by that? I need you to bind this to your forehead. Let it be a, you know, a frontlet between your eyes, right between the eyes. You know, uh, what does he mean by that? And then to the doorposts of your house. Are these literal things? Well, the uh, Orthodox Jew in Israel takes this very literally. And you will see the uh, phylacteries uh, that they will put in these little boxes. There's a little black box. And they'll have string on it. And they'll tie one onto their forehead when they're doing the morning prayers. When they're actually praying this Deuteronomy 6. They'll have one that they strap to their arm. Uh, usually to the left arm closest to the heart. Right? That's what we're referring to here is having our heart consecrated to the Lord with these things, these spiritual truths. And they'll bind that, symbolizing it's close to their hand, uh, and they have it bound close to their heart. And then there's another little thing called the mezuzah, and it gets nailed to the doorpost of their house, the right-hand doorpost of their house, and it tips in just a little bit. It's a rectangular shape, and you can get them in all sizes and all expense from $5 to uh, $50,000. They can be diamond encrusted and all kinds of stuff. The largest one is on the Temple Mound. It's the largest one in the world and it stands about that tall. Um, but these are tipped in, meaning that God is welcome into our house. Now, if you go to Israel and you ask a Jew over there in Israel, any Jew, just pick one, and you say, what is that? What does that mean, this little mezuzah that's nailed to the doorpost of their house or to a business? Or whatever. They were even in the hotel. I don't know if you noticed that they're in the hotel. Uh, although they got it wrong. They had pointed out which, you know, either they're making a statement or they just have it wrong. I don't know. But anywhere else you go in Israel, you'll find the mezuzah tipped in. And you ask any good Jew, what does this mean? And they'll say this. I have yet to find one to ever tell me the true meaning of it. They'll usually say, it's good luck. That's what it is. It's a good luck term. Well, the Orthodox Jew didn't intend for it to be good luck. Inside of each of those phylacteries, the little boxes, is a copy of Deuteronomy 6, 4 through 9. This very portion of scripture that I just shared with you. Because they want it to mean something to them. And they take this very, very literally. And so they figure if God says, you need to bind this to your hand. You need to bind this as a front lip between your eyes. And you need to put it on the doorpost of your house. He's talking figuratively. And we'll see in a few moments what he meant. They're saying, well, we need to take it literally. <clears throat> so we're going to do this very literally, and we're going to actually bind it to our arm while we're having our devotions. We're actually going to bind it to our forehead while we're having our devotions, and we're going to put it on the doorpost of our house. Now, they're very superstitious. In fact, if you go into the old city, Jerusalem, it's kind of cute. You'll see uh, where they have done some remodeling. Now, this old city is pretty old. I mean, we're talking, you know, first century. We're talking a long time. And on the right-hand doorpost of some of the uh, buildings that you go into, you'll see a dark hole. That's all it is, it's a dark hole. And you ask, well, what, what is that hole? Well, back, way back in that hole is the original wall of this building. And it had an ancient mezuzah on there. And they're so superstitious, they can't take that mezuzah off. So what they do is they build around the mezuzah. 
and build on their new facing of their of their new stonework or whatever they're doing. Over the years, people kiss their hands and they reach in there and they touch that mezuzah. So that's why it's black. Isn't that wonderful? And of course, I wait until the tourists reach their hand back in there and touch it before I tell them why it's black. But anyway, it's just fun. So you have these mezuzahs and they're very superstitious about it. And they've lost the point of what it was all about. Why did God say <clears throat> to bind them as frontlets on your between your eyes, and why bind them to your right hand, and why put it on the doorpost of your house? Well, it's an illustration, actually. Uh, you know, when you're talking about your hand, you're talking about your daily work. Whatever your hand does, and you do out to God, the Bible tells us, their daily work, their forehead, that's their mind, between their eyes. Uh, you know, I've been accused of uh, giving it right between the eyes. My dad was the same way when he would preach. And I think any preacher worth his salt shares the truth. Now, if you don't share the truth in love, then you've wasted your time. You can catch more flies with honey than you can vinegar, right? And sometimes I'll use my humor a little bit when I'm in a really tough point because the Word of God is tough. It's hard. It's right between the eyes, devil barrel. And you either accept that or you can perish because you want a sweet Jesus message. Well, that's fine. That's fine if that's what you want. If you want a little five-minute message, if that's what you want, you know, lots of music and five-minute message, there's a hundred churches out there that you can go to. hundred of them. But you know what's happening today? Those churches are closing because they won't make a stand based on the Word of God. Amen. So he says, whatever you put your hand to, wherever your mind is at, you need to bind these things into your mind. What's the doorpost that's in your home? That's in your home. What is your home really like? That's where the rubber meets the road, doesn't it? You know what's fun to do? Just ask the kids in the home what the home's like. That's a wonderful thing to do. If you really want to know what somebody's like, ask their kids. Yeah, my kids live far enough away, you can't. <laughs> but the family life, you know, to study, to read, to meditate. When you have your devotions, don't just read a portion of Scripture and call it good and have your prayer time. You pray those words back to God. You say, God, this is convicting in my heart and life. I want you to change this in my life. You pray those words back to God. God, this is something that's important for me. I want you to encourage me in this area. You pray those words back to God. God, I see myself failing in that area. Make me strong in that area. Pray those same words back to the Lord. It's a conversation. That's what devotions are supposed to be. God is talking. He wants you to listen, but he wants you to participate. Did you notice that the words say, the Lord, your God? He could have said, you are my people, and been possessive, but in the sense that he becomes passive because he wants you to possess him. It says, the Lord, your God. Where are we? with our devotions? Where are we with our attitude towards the things of the Lord? Jesus said, this is the greatest commandment. And it's not even in the Ten Commandments. Why is it the greatest commandment? Because it speaks right at the beginning of our love for God. You want to talk about an emotion? You'll do anything for love, won't you? Sure you will. If you genuinely love God, you'll genuinely be concerned about what he wants to speak to you about, about the life he wants you to live, about honoring and serving him. But the problem is we're in love with ourselves. We're in love with what we want. We're in love with the temptations of this world. And that's why we're worthless. You need to recommit to your first love. Well, I brought something, and I'd like for the uh, elders to come up front. The um, I knew I wasn't going to be able to do this. I get it. It came in this really nice case, but I have this uh, little box here with some mezuzahs in it, and they're all different. They all have the same thing at the very top, and that is the Hebrew alphabet shin, which is the beginning of the word shaddai, 
and so it refers to God right up at the top, and you and I have talked about this many times. But um, I have some of these uh, mezuzahs that I brought back over from Israel. I'm going to give each of you um, one of these. You bet. And what goes inside of the little boxes, the little phylacteries, or the tefillin, which is the English word for uh, phylactery, what goes inside? Well, what goes inside is a little scroll. <clears throat> and inside the mezuzah that's on the doorposts of their houses <clears throat> is a little scroll with Deuteronomy chapter 6, verses 4 through 9 that we just studied this morning. Now, if I was a nice pastor, I would have scrolled these up, and I would have put them inside the mezuzah, and what they do is they usually either put a piece of um, uh, felt, usually, on the back side of that, and then they nail that to the doorpost or house and turn it in. But because I'm not a nice pastor, I didn't scroll these up. That's going to take some time. But I'm going to give each of you uh, your own personal little scroll. And it does fit, so you don't have to cut it down. All you got to do is roll it up on a pencil. Well, you know, I hope, yeah, I do. Uh, you can roll it up on a pencil and get it nice and tight, stick it in there, and then you can glue whatever you want to glue on the back side of it. And I'm also not asking you to put it on the doorpost of your house, all right, because I realize that, you know, puts a hole. But um, you can put it on the coffee table or stick it up in a, in a medicine cabinet or whatever you want to do with it. But I just wanted to bring you back something from Israel. And to me, uh, this is a good reminder of this portion of Scripture. This is spiritual leadership here in this church, and we need the reminder. I have my own mezuzah, and uh, it's just something fun. It's a visual. It's a visual aid. It's, it's kinetic. It's touchable. It's tangible. Um, you're going to have to come up with your own visual aid if that's what it takes. But in the illustration here is to have something that reminds us of what we're supposed to be doing. Let's take a moment and pray for these men and pray for this church in closing prayer. Heavenly Father, thank you for the leadership of this church, and I ask God that you would just minister to them first so that they can minister to the flock. Lord, I also pray for this flock, that we would get our eyes off of ourselves and our own personal desires and needs and start loving you. I trust, God, that our love for you is more than just words, that it comes out in our actions, our attitudes, our emotions. And Lord, I just ask that you might bless everyone that is here, that has heard your word this morning, for the greatest commandment is that to honor God in all of our ways. We just ask that you would just minister to our hearts in these things. In Jesus' name, amen. Good morning. May God bless you.